Good afternoon. Welcome to the Vermont edition of our state webinar series, exploring the findings from a American Farmland Trust recently released Farms Under Threat, the State of the States report. Before we get started, let me run through some quick logistics. Everyone has been muted, so no need to do that yourself. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you can do so by going to the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. That orange arrow at the top of the panel allows the panel to shrink and reopen. You'll see a question section of that control panel. You can pop that section out by clicking on the little square on the right-hand side. That decouples it from the control panel. You can type your questions and comments in there, and we have built in a couple of times for questions um, during and at the end of the presentation. We're recording this webinar, and we'll send the link of the recording to everybody who's registered. Please feel free to share this recording with others. So let me now introduce myself. I am Chris Coffin, American Farmland Trust's Senior Policy Advisor. I also direct our newly launched National Agricultural Land Network, which I'll talk about at the end of the webinar. Co-hosting with me are Nate Latoile, AFT's New England Director, and J.D. Pottern, who is AFT's New England Program Manager. And for those of you who aren't familiar with American Farmland Trust, let me do a very quick introduction. We're a national nonprofit membership organization founded in 1980. We believe that saving the land that sustains us means focusing not just on retaining and protecting the agricultural land base, but on the management of that wet land as well, and on the farmers, ranchers, and landowners who work the land. We work from kitchen tables to the halls of Congress, from direct land protection to soil health and water quality initiatives, to training service providers to help a new generation of farmers and ranchers gain access to land. Our programming and research informs our state and federal policy development and advocacy. We have six regional offices and a national office located in Washington, DC. And with that, let me turn it over to Nate. Thanks, Chris. We, we're delighted to be joined today by a number of valued partners, including staff from BHCB, the Agency of Agriculture, and the State Attorney General's Office. Several land trusts, including VLT, Upper Valley Land Trust, South Hero Land Trust, uh, NOFA Vermont, Land for Good, uh, several conservation districts, several farmers, municipal officials, and other nonprofits from across the state, and representatives from several USDA agencies, including the Forest Service, Rural Development, and NRCS. In fact, we, we, we'd like to recognize and thank the Natural Resource Conservation Service, especially for their collaboration and support of this project. They've been an integral partner, as has our research partner in this project, Conservation Science Partners. And now I want to welcome our, our two very special guests. With us this morning are, or, or this afternoon, I should say, sorry, our Secretary of Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, Anson Tebitz, and Gus Selig, the Executive Director of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Thank you both so much for taking the time to be with us today, and thank you both for the important and complimentary work your agencies do to keep farmland in farming and farmers on the land. AFT has long seen Vermont as a leader among states in farmland conservation, and it's nice to see that validated in our State of the States report. Vermont ranks in the top five in our policy scorecard and has several policy innovations in addition to the policies that we looked at, including its farm viability program, its Act 250 mitigation approach, and its Working Lands Enterprise Fund. Yet, as this study shows, farmland continued to be converted, including over 8,000 acres of what we've identified as nationally significant land, which is land best suited for intensive crop and food production. Most of the conversion is to low-density residential development, and while we did not map it, we assume some farmland is being abandoned and is growing back to trees. Gus and, and, and Secretary Tebitz, we, we'd like each of you, if you would, to talk a little bit about what, what types of threats you see to Vermont's agricultural land base and what worries you about keeping a sufficient land base to support an industry that's so important to Vermont's economy. And, and what threat or threats do you think you don't have the, the sufficient tools for or enough tools to address? Um, Secretary Tebitz, per, perhaps we can start with you. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, thank you, Nate, and thank you, Chris, and everyone from American Farmland Trust and all our, our partners that are on the uh, line with us today. Um, 
you over the years have all done tremendous work uh, long before I arrived on the scene a, a couple of years ago. So we appreciate all the leadership you've done over the years. So I think probably the most important thing that is threatening our, our farm line right now is the economic viability of, of farming. Um, let, let's just begin with dairy farming over the last three or four years. Um, uh, really stressed, um, no doubt about it. Uh, was headed in the right direction uh, um, early uh, early winter and into the spring. Things were looking up, uh, coming out of this trough that they'd been in for a while. And whammo, um, the uh, pandemic hit, which was okay for a, a couple of weeks and three weeks. Uh, but as the world and as uh, the nation shut down and a lot of it has not reopened yet. Uh, that threatened a lot of our, our farmers, particularly on the dairy side, it threatened our artisan cheesemakers. Um, and we had spent, um, you know, uh, a couple of decades uh, working on diversifying dairy. And uh, our cheesemakers who had, uh, you know, gotten teed up and were in those, some of those bigger restaurants and markets and institutions and cheese shops in New York and Washington, uh, they all closed. So. I think the most important thing that threatens our, our land um, and our farmland right now is the economic viability of farming right now. Coupled with that, I think a lot of people from away outside of the borders of Vermont are looking at their lives. They're reassessing their lives. Uh, do I want to live in the city again after this? Um, particularly, we're hearing anecdotal evidence of people buying land in Vermont or homes uh, without even seeing it now. We'll have a better picture going forward with the when some results come from the property transfer tax in Vermont, whether that's occurring. Um, now people may be buying uh, maybe buying that land up and they have no intention to farm it. Um, they just want to live peacefully, quietly, and with so many things that are shut down now, they may not need to be in office anymore. Uh, so they can re work remotely uh, in beautiful Vermont, uh, but not necessarily need that land for agriculture production. So those are a couple of the highlights that I think that um, right now are, are, are front and center as far as uh, making sure that our land remains in uh, production, which is the critical part, uh, not letting it grow up to brush and also actively farming, whether it be dairy, uh, whether it be vegetables, uh, whether it be hemp, uh, whether it be maple, uh, we all need it to be uh, in active production. So thank you for the, for the question. I look forward to the rest of the program to uh, answer any questions that anyone has for me. Appreciate it. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, Gus, how about some, some perspectives from you on this question? Well, I want to uh, first thank you for having us today and for the work that went into this report. Uh, AFT has been a great partner to the state of Vermont and to its efforts to protect farmland going back to the 1980s uh, when it was a very new concept across the country. And uh, you hosted a bunch of uh, a legislative visit from our House Ag Committee down to Connecticut and Massachusetts that made a critical difference in the legislature's decisions to invest in these programs over time. So uh, appreciate um, your sticking with it all these years and building upon the success we've had. Uh, in terms of your question, I think Secretary Tebbets has hit the nail on the head. Um, that this is a very difficult economic time. It was true before the pandemic, uh, and the pandemic has simply amplified, along with what we expect is going to be a very difficult recession, um, the pressures on farmers. And from my perspective, the pandemic has also, I think, revealed to all of us what it means to be an essential worker. And we understand now how important people are who stock shelves in our supermarkets, childcare workers, and we need a national dialogue as we see supply chains internationally get interrupted for all kinds of important things like face masks. The importance of viewing farmers as absolutely essential workers. So as we think about policy, we clearly at the Housing and Conservation Board think significantly about conservation and farm viability. Um, but I think we need a different discussion um, that I know you've been engaged in about how we value economically farmers, no matter what products they're making, whether it's vegetables, whether it's uh, their goats or 
other forms of dairy. Um, we've had across our country a, a, a food policy that really has um, been to some degree a race to the bottom in terms of fairly compensating, especially small producers, um, which really even our large farms in Vermont are small by national standards. So um, we absolutely see the, the, not just the pandemic, but the related recession as a great threat to agriculture as we've known it. The loss of specialty markets like restaurants is a big deal for lots of Vermont farmers. Some are adjusting well to these conditions and selling more locally, um, but these are critically important questions. The other thing that Secretary Tebbets just hit upon is the desire of people to live in Vermont. And through the 30 years that I've done this work, um, there have been a number of upswings in the real estate market where people can afford to buy land at well above the cost um, that people working that land can make a living from. Um, we saw this after 9 11, um, and I think we are reading stories in the newspaper today about, as the secretary said, about people buying land sight unseen. So there is a potential as we readjust our economy and people working remotely becomes a norm to see much more pressure on the landscape by people who make considerable amounts of money or have considerable assets, whether in New York or Boston or DC, wanting to buy a piece of Vermont for any number of reasons. And that will have an impact um, and perhaps accelerate the loss or access to farmland. Um, I think the last issue that we really need to take note of um, is the need. Vermont is among, is I think the second oldest state in the, in the country right now. Eventually that will change. Um, but in agriculture, we have an aging demographic in terms of farm ownership. It's something we and our partners, particularly the Vermont Land Trust, the Intervale Center are working on very hard. There's a great appetite um, for young people to get into agriculture. It's a capital intensive business and it's gonna take more tools to address that issue. And without addressing how to make entry into agriculture a better business, business enterprise, a better concern for success, um, we will face more difficulty and more threats to farmland. Thank you so much, Gus um, and, and, and Secretary. Uh, one more question at, at, at the start here. We're gonna have a few more questions later on, but, but maybe one more right here at the start. Uh, how do we continue to engage Vermonters around the issue of, of farmland conservation? You know, both of you have been engaged in, in, in Vermont and, and agriculture for a long time and and AFT is always trying to think through how we we and our partners can really um, push these conversations to the fore and and get people to recognize them as as important and and put them into the minds of people so that they are in their thoughts. Um, any thoughts on that? Maybe again, uh, starting with you, Secretary, first. Yes, uh, thank you. I I I get the sense, you know, in in every farmer's heart, um, I get the sense they really don't want to. Uh, give up their land. They don't want to, you know, sell off five acres here, ten acres here to, um, you know, get through the next, you know, few years. They really don't want to do that. There's also, I think, Vermonters uh, actually really do support agriculture and believe in it, and they want them to succeed. There's some misconceptions about it. Um, it's, it's, there's some, it's some people call it the red barn part, where they, they think. Farming should just be the red barn, and, that, and that's what it is. Um, farmers are innovators. Um, they're the, some of the first people to embrace technology. Um, but we've got to, and they're also um, facing great challenges uh, with the environment. Um, they are under extreme pressure um, with our phosphorus and our lakes and so forth and, and potential runoff. Um, they're making huge capital investments with that. Um, so there's a, sort of this interesting dynamic on the public really wants them to succeed and to be well and be part of our landscape. And there's another section of the of the, of the population that thinks they are the you know so-called polluters, um, and they need to be reined in and they need to be uh, just uh, a different size and scale. Um, so that dynamic is going in, but but in the heart and heart of things, 
I really think Vermonters support agriculture and they will make the investments um, in agriculture. Um, and we just need to keep uh, you know, telling that story of how valuable it is. And this pandemic, as Gus talked about, I think people have done a reset. Uh, people have really figured out, hey, you know, farmers are actually feeding us and that's pretty darn important. And we know we've got some problems with a, you know, a national system that really doesn't work for everybody. We saw that in some of the um, meat, big meat plants. When you have five or six big meat plants, that probably is not the best system to have. We need more regional approaches to what we're doing. And if we have a strong regional approach to agriculture where our farmers can access mat, uh, markets that are in the big populations, I think they can uh, they can make a go of it will be valuable and we can and we can protect this land, which is, it is so valuable um, and uh, going forward. So there's just a, a couple of thoughts I have about uh, moving forward. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, Gus, what about your any thoughts on, on that question? Well, I think your question about how to engage uh, starts with the ag community. And I think, as I said in my opening thoughts, AFT has just played such a vital role in that in Vermont historically. Um, we're fortunate that um, some other statutes in Vermont, our planning statutes, ask both our local planning commissions and our regional planning commissions to address these issues of, of uh, what's the importance of agricultural land and do you want to protect it or not? And, and there's very few regional plans that don't suggest that the protection of land is important. And we've seen any number of communities really step forward in aggressively planning for conservation. Um, and in some cases where the resources are there putting creating local conservation funds. Um, so I, I really think that that the that the infrastructure is there in Vermont, and then it becomes a question of resources. And I think um, if I'm speaking fearfully, I worry about what federal policy will be toward the states in terms of the deficits that almost every state in the country currently faces because Vermont has been very supportive and very generous in investing in farmland conservation and investing in our current use program over a long period of time. And it's really gonna take an active federal government to help the states that are on the right track and, and Vermont is not the only one um, that utilizes these programs. Um, it's gonna take a federal state partnership uh, to keep states from having to shut down some of those essential programs or cut them back. Um, so I think that, that your policy focus at the national level and your partnership in advocacy at the national level probably has got to go beyond the typical things we see in the Farm Bill uh, to make sure that the states can continue to invest in programs like current use, like the purchase of development, like rights like the Working Lands Enterprise Board. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to stop. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, Nathan, I think we are now at the point of turning to the findings from our Farms Under Threat report. Um, thank you, Gus, and thank you, Secretary Tevitz. Um, those have been very helpful insights, and we understand that you will be with us for the hour, so we will come back to you all in a bit. But now we're going to focus on the findings, and I'm afraid there's a little bit of background noise, so anybody on the speakers who are not muted, please mute for a minute. Um, so we're now going to move into the findings. The State of the States is the second in our Farms Under Threat research series. Um, it, we used a multi-pronged approach in this um, second research project that includes advanced spatial mapping to identify threats to agricultural land, and an in-depth analysis of every state's policy responses. We're using this report to raise public awareness, 
to inform state and federal policy, and to encourage more direct and permanent agricultural land um, protection. For those of you who were not able to join us for our launch webinars in May, I'm gonna to touch very quickly on our national findings. We looked at a period in, for this report from 2001 to 2016, which was a period of historically low housing starts and with a deep recession in the midst. Nevertheless, the U.S. converted 11 million acres of agricultural land in this 15-year period. That's equivalent to all the land planted in the U.S. to fruits, nuts, and vegetables in 2017. The majority of that conversion was to low-density residential land use. We've known this type of conversion was happening because all across the country, scattered large lot housing has been fragmenting and disrupting farming and ranching for years. But until this report, no one has ever been able to map it and measure it. And once we mapped it, we realized to just think how big of a threat it is. Importantly, more than 4.4 million acres of the land converted was what we have identified as nationally significant land. That is land that is best suited for intensive food and crop production. In addition to the National Farms Under Threat State of the States report, we were lucky to receive funding to produce a regional Farms Under Threat report that weaves together some of the national spatial and policy findings with some specific New England findings. So I'm going to turn it over to Jamie Potter now to just give a quick preview of that report. Great. Thanks, Chris. Great. Thanks, um, Chris. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, my everyone. name is my name Jamie is Potter. I'm the New England Program Manager um, with AFT. AFT. I'm getting a little feedback. Yeah, feedback. Anyone else can hear that? I'm going to keep going, though. Um, uh, this past winter, um, my colleague Laura Barley and I authored um, this regional report Chris just mentioned, um, entitled Farms Under Threat, A New England Perspective. Uh, the report dives a little deeper into the New England region as a whole and also draws on a variety of other reports and data sets like the USDA Agricultural Census um, and the New England Food Vision. It also draws on some of our ongoing work funded by Farm Credit East and CoBank. The report goes beyond the farmland itself and also examines threats and opportunities for New England's farm viability and its farmers. It centers on issues of justice, equity, and climate change, and provides recommendations for how we might achieve greater regional resilience for the future. So we encourage you to download and read the report, um, which you can find on our Farmland Information Center, and we have the link right here on the slide. And I just wanted to note that I'm also available to present on these findings to your community um, or to send you a copy. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I, I stay on the call through the end and happy to answer any questions at the end of this call. Thank you. Unmuted. Thanks so much, Jamie. So now we're going to dive into the data available for Vermont on a new interactive website that we built for this project. Um, and we're going to be ably assisted in this cruise through the website by Beth Frazier, who um, is also with AFT and is our expert navigator here. We're going to start with the reports and data tab over here on the right hand side, just to show you what um, some of the things you can do with this website uh, include. Here you can find the full report, the executive summary, the methodology that was used for both the spatial findings and the policy scorecard. And here under geospatial data layers, down one more tab there, is where you will find access to a form if you are looking to receive any of these um, data layers that we used we will be making them available um, click on that link and it'll take you to a form to fill out and we'll be back in touch with information about when that uh, data layers will be available so now let's go to the drop down menu and pick vermont and from here, you can access both the spatial maps and the policy scorecard. And we're going to start on the spatial side. And here we actually want to show you this downloadable conversion summary down here on the lower left hand side. Um, that is a nifty two page uh, summary of the spatial findings that we hope folks will feel are particularly useful and easy to download for those who are challenged by connectivity, um, as many of us are. 
at this point in time. So this can be used to link on to a website, to share with members, to share with policymakers um, at both the local and state level, and we hope it's a useful resource for everyone. So now we are going to actually go through the four data layers we have. We're going to start with land cover and use. We used multiple national data sets to develop the best available spatial inventory of agricultural land use in the US. You can zoom in on this data layer to identify every type of land use in the state, including land we've identified as low density residential development. That is the orange um, layer that you can see here, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, we also, for the first time, attempted to spatially identify woodland associated with a farm, and that's the woodland uh, acreage from the U.S. Census of Agriculture, but never before has there been an effort to actually map that amount of land. So our mapping shows 1.32 million acres of agricultural land in Vermont, including 535,100 acres of cropland, 290,300 acres of pasture, and 494,900 acres, 494,900 acres of woodland associated with farms. So now let's move to PDR values. Here we wanted to analyze the quality of land that is being lost to development, not just the quantity. So we created, with the help of a national panel of experts, an index to quantify the productivity, versatility, and resiliency of every acre of land in the US. So this map shows those ranges of PBR values. The darker the green, the higher the value. And the higher the PBR value, the higher the suitability of that land for long-term intensive crop production, especially for food crops such as fruits, nuts, vegetables, and staple grains. We then took these PBR values and used them to identify nationally significant land. This next land shows that nationally significant, this next map shows this, uh, the green, this is the nationally significant land identified in Vermont. There's 463,700 acres that fall into this category, or about 35% of the state's agricultural land base. Most of this is cropland, 375,000 acres, with the rest pretty evenly split between pasture and woodland. The last category that we're going to look at is conversion. And again, we use the time frame of 2001 to 2016. We mapped the conversion of agricultural land to two types of land use. The first is the conversion we're used to seeing and mapping. So urban and high density, residential, commercial, and industrial development, typically around the edges of cities and towns. This category also includes rural, industrial, and energy production sites, including oil and gas well pads and large scale solar installations. The second type is low density residential development or what we've dubbed LDR. These areas range from lower density subdivisions to rural areas where more and more individual houses are being built. The vast majority of Vermont's conversion over this time period, 83%, was to this low density residential development. What's important to note about LDR is both that it is modeled and that there may well be active agriculture on lands designated as LDR. And we know that some of these small parcels may be highly productive and profitable. But we also know that LDR tends to be a transitional land use. Land in Vermont that was considered LDR in 2001 was five times more likely to be converted to urban and highly developed land by 2016 than other agricultural land. And we know that continued conversion to LDR creates management challenges for producers who have to adjust to farming in and around non-farm neighbors. So total ag land converted over this period was 17,800 acres. Um, this consisted of 8,400 acres of cropland, 7,300 acres of woodland, and 5,600 acres of pasture. And um, as Nate mentioned earlier, um, 8,300 acres of this land converted was land we considered nationally significant. Um, and 
63% of the land converted had PVR values in the upper half of the state's range of farmland. So the state's better land for intensive crop and food production. We get are especially concerned about the loss of this, especially productive land for both environmental and economic reasons. From an agricultural viability or economic perspective, as producers are forced to more marginal land, input costs tend to go up and crop yields tend to go down. And from an environmental perspective, the loss of this more productive land creates more pressure to convert woodlots, pastures, and buffer strips to cropland. So reducing conversion to development is critical to making progress on water quality and wildlife habitat goals. So with that, let me stop and turn it over to Nate for a little perspectives and a little quick zoom on the spatial findings. Sure, Chris, thank you. Sure, Chris, thank you. Um, you know, uh, Chris, you, you you did a really great job there. I, I think that just kind of one point that I want to uh, try to accentuate a little bit more. What's incredibly important when we talk about Vermont and its farmland loss is, is recognizing the threat that LDR presents. Um, LDR, as Chris mentioned, represents more than four-fifths of Vermont's farmland loss. Um, this is a category that's never been quantified before. Um, AFT has really tried to, to dive deep into understanding this, this low-density uh, data set and, and really understanding where some of that farmland loss is that we just haven't been able to track previously. While the percentage of farmland loss in Vermont may be lower than in many other Northeast states, the ability to capture the impact of, of LDR is is very powerful. Beth, if you could uh, zoom into the St. Albans, Swanton area up uh, there in Franklin County. Yeah. Uh, this is an area that has seen a significant level of conversion during our time frame. Uh, but if we flip over to the to the land use tab and we can see the amount of low density residential that we've been able to include in that, uh, prior tools would have shown all of that orange land as as either farmland or forest land or, or some other natural type of land. And we're able to identify that the predominant land use in that area has now actually swapped over to a low density residential. And any farmland that is still in that area, and there is some, as Chris mentioned, again, just to, to drive home the point that she made, it's five times more likely to be converted to high density um, development. So this does become a really powerful tool to, to use for local prioritization. Um, we, we really encourage folks to, to reach out, uh, get to know this data a little bit more. Um, we can share these data sets. We would love to, and, and you can really begin to uh, use them for, for local prioritizations, planning, et cetera. Uh, Chris, how about back to you? I'm muted. Great. Thanks so much, Nathan. So um, before we go to the policy scorecard, we are actually going to stop and launch a, a a poll to get some impact input from all of you. We're interested in your perspectives about what you think will be the biggest drivers of agricultural land conversion in Vermont over the next 10 to 20 years. And the reason we ask this now, because as we're thinking about policy responses, what might have been um, important over the past 10, 20, 30, 40 years may not be the most important going forward. So we like your perspectives. Um, if you think that there's something, another driver, other than this, feel free to write it in on your question panel, and you are welcome to vote for more than one. And if you're having any problems voting, um, it may be that you're in full screen mode, so you might need to come out of that. So we'll take uh, another 30 seconds or so to see if there are other votes. Okay, what are we seeing here? Um, this is um, this is interesting. I'm pausing because it's a little different than what we have seen from most other states in that the large number of folks who feel that generational transfer is an, a is a particular challenge, and um, obviously, I think because of dairy and the time that we're in, the concern about the continued viability of farm enterprises is especially important. 
So that's good to know. And now we're going to turn to the policy scorecard. Our intent here is to highlight effective elements of state policies from around the country that are addressing the historical drivers of land conversion. Um, so poorly planned development, lack of profitability in agriculture, and the fact that land is very vulnerable when it transfers between generations. This is our first effort at a state policy scorecard. And we know that there are many ways that states support agriculture. And I think that this is especially true in Vermont um, with the number and valuable programs that are run both through the Agency of Agriculture and BHCB around promotion, marketing, business development, support with cooperative extension. What we wanted to do is to focus on six different types of policies and programs that tie directly to the land. And so you'll see these on the left. We looked at purchase of ag conservation easement programs or our name for what is the Vermont Farmland Conservation Program, PDR programs, farmland preservation. Vermont is one of 28 states with it. We looked at land use planning and growth management. Again, we know that this is primarily localities that are driving this, but the state can have an important and active role as Vermont does in guiding some of those local decisions. We looked at property tax relief for agricultural land. Again, recognizing that working lands require much less in services than they typically are um, asked to um, offer up in taxes. We looked at agricultural district programs. This is not something Vermont has. There are 14 states that have them. They provide a variety of different protections and incentives. Some um, protect agricultural landowners um, from being annexed um, by local governments. There's sometimes limits on the use of eminent domain. There's often protection from the siting of public facilities and infrastructure. Some states offer tax incentives to landowners and farmers in those districts, and some tie their district enrollment to their state farmland protection programs. And then lastly, we looked at two programs that are really focused on, or policies that are focused on that access to land and generational transfer, so farm link programs. And an important point here, we looked only at state-sponsored programs. We recognize that there's a lot of farm linking work that's happening around the country, um, but we feel that it is important for states to be stepping up their game in terms of support for the type of services that farm link provides, so that's why we included that here. And lastly, state leasing programs. We looked at the ways that states are making their state-owned land available to farmers and ranchers for agriculture. Sometimes that's their primary purpose, but more often agricultural use is secondary to protecting wildlife habitat or generating income um, for some other public purpose. So um, here we go. If you look down, Vermont, again, as I said, is um, does really well. Um, it is essentially tied in its overall score for third with Maryland and Pennsylvania behind just New Jersey and Delaware. So congratulations to Vermont for being um, really a leader in um, agricultural retention and protection. We're going to look at a couple of these scores in a little more detail. So the way to do it is to go select a policy or program. We're going to start with PACE, um, and here, Beth, if you actually can go all the way down to the um, bottom, you can see how we scored it, and these are the, the components that went into each of these headings at the top, um, which will help give you an idea of how Vermont scores in particular categories. So on PACE, if we can go back up, because Vermont sits third here with its farmland conservation program. Um, importantly, if you look over way, all the way over to the right, it is number one in the country in acres protected to acres converted, which means that it is doing the best out of any program in keeping pace with that threat of conversion. Um, the where it, um, the only states 
that do better um, than Vermont on average funds spent per capita, only state is Delaware. Um, Vermont's per capita investment in farmland conservation over the life of the program has been $4 per capita. In Delaware, it's $6. So just to know that that's the sort of difference there and why Vermont's not the leader. Um, and while we're on pace, I just want to note the importance of the Federal Agricultural Conservation Easement Program and the Regional Conservation Protection Program, both run through Regional Conservation Partnership Program, excuse me, both run through Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, ASEP and its predecessor, the Farm and Rangeland Protection Program, have brought an additional $58 million in federal matching funds to Vermont's farmland conservation efforts, and they're a hugely important partner. And I would just note um, the, the incredible and important role that Senator Leahy has played in being an advocate for a very long time um, for those federal programs. So let's go now to land use planning. Um, Vermont drops a little bit further down in points here, where it loses points relative to the higher scoring states, is that it doesn't require local comprehensive planning. We recognize that it's incentivized. We do recognize that there are regional planning commissions. And that because those local comprehensive plans are not required, there's not necessarily that of Ability and complete consistency between the state's planning goals and what happens on the ground locally. The states that score higher here, particularly the two that lead the pack, so Oregon and Washington, require all local units of government to identify their important agricultural resources and really make them take steps to stabilize their agricultural land base. So, in some way, those two states have combined a little bit of a of a stick with their carrots. In looking at property tax relief, um, you will see that Vermont is neck and neck for the top um, with California. California gets the edge only because of the amount of land in farms that is enrolled in its current use program. In Vermont, enrollment constitutes just under 50% of land in farms, and in California, that number is 65% of land enrolled in farms. And then lastly, just looking at state leasing, again, Vermont does really well here. Um, probably the reason it is not higher is both that it's a real, a, not a very significant amount of acreage that is leased. We do recognize that the Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation leases about 700 acres of state land for maple sugaring. Um, it's not clear that Vermont has identified any state-owned land beyond sugar bushes that might be suitable for leasing. And the reason why we raise this is that we feel that state-owned land may offer additional leasing opportunities, especially for young, beginning, and uh, BIPOC farmers. So um, that's that. I do want to make a note about Vermont um, land link. We do recognize that there's a lot of great work happening in Vermont, and we would note that Intervale, Land for Good, UVM Extension, Vermont Land Trust, and um, BHCB are engaged in farm link, and that is great. And we just want to say that we recognize that Again, our point has been only that we feel that these types of efforts are so important that where there can be a robust um, state support for this kind of work is valuable. So I'm gonna stop there. I hope it was a helpful cruise through the findings. Um, we are going to come out of the website now. Um, as we do, we are going to launch another poll that asks which policy or policies you think would be most valuable to focus on. And I recognize that given that many folks feel that ag viability is the biggest driver of conversion, that that answer might not even be on this list. And we didn't have room for 
state-owned land and we didn't have room for farm links. So if you feel that any or all of those are more important than what's here, please feel free to write them into the question box. So we will stop for a minute for answers. Okay, I think we will keep pressing on because we're running a little behind time. Um, this is good to know that there's a strong interest in focusing, continued focus on um, the farmland conservation program and the use of easements, whether it's state or local, as Gus mentioned, um, and land use planning, and again, thinking about property tax relief. So we will be holding a series of webinars through the National Ag Land Network starting in the fall, where we are gonna dig deep into each one of these policies and go through them one at a time to really look at who's leading amongst the states in each of these categories and why, how did they get there? I suspect that um, Vermont, we will ask Vermont to help us in a couple of these categories because you are um, at the top. So stay tuned for more information on that. Um, as we go out, you will see this next map here. We did not include the protected agricultural land in our spatial data. You might have noticed that as you were looking through. The reason for that is that there is not a national, again, this was a national report, so we have to rely on national data sets. And while we know that Vermont keeps this data, the rest of the country doesn't necessarily. So we are building this um, database of protected land. You can see that Vermont um, lights up brilliantly green here, which is great to see. I believe that we have all the data for Vermont, but if anybody thinks that they haven't been um, asked by us yet for that, please let us know. And with that, I will, um, I'll stop and turn it back over to Nathan, who has been looking at questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, you know, I we, we are running a little bit behind in time, so I, I would like to ask just one question, but um, may, maybe Secretary Tebbets and, and Gus, you, you can each give a, a fairly short answer to, to the following one. Um, Given the fact that, that the first poll that we did had such a high prominence on, on generational transfer, and both of you mentioned that in, in your opening comments, I'd like to ask you kind of a more targeted question. What more do you think Vermont can do to address this issue? And, and remember, uh, Secretary, to, to unmute yourself before you try to dive into answering. We, we might have lost uh, Secretary Tebbets. Um, Gus, if, if, if you're still on, perhaps uh, take yourself off mute and, and give this one a shot. Um, hi, I just got unmuted. Uh, <laughs> So thank you. Um, you know, I, I think we need to continue uh, on all the fronts we've been on. Vermont needs to continue its long-term support for current use. It needs to continue its efforts uh, on development rights. It's it, it's invested greatly through the WELEB program at the enterprise level and through the farm viability program. Um, and uh, and and there's been extensive work on on how much more we need to do uh, in the way of technical assistance and support for farmers. But I think uh, as you looked at the questions about your survey, access to and the ability to own a farm and get started in agriculture because of the capital needs required is a really big fundamental question that's in front of us. Um, the Vermont Land Trust has spoken with us about uh, the need for deploying very large amounts of capital um, to help people get onto their first farm. And I think that that's a, 
where that capital can come from and how it gets made available and at what the value of the development rights program has always been the degree to which it lowers the cost of entry into agriculture, how we can further lower those costs while supporting young entrepreneurs is going to be really, really important uh, going into the future. So I think we have many of the tools we need, but we need to enhance them. Uh, we need more support. We need more of a federal state partnership. Uh, we're currently waiting to see if a beginning farmer and rancher grant will be renewed by USDA. Uh, that's been very successful, um, but that's just the beginning of the tools we'll need to address that issue. Thank you so Hi, much. Um, perfect, Secretary, take it away. Sure, sure. Well, thank you. Um, I, you know, it, it, it is at the top of the list when we talk to uh, our farmers is about is about the transfer. And I'll just give one example. We have a, a rather large farm that's um, and none of his children want to continue uh, with that operation. And he believes he probably has uh, maybe 10 years left that he wants to be actively farming before he retires. And so he started the process, uh, he wants to start the process now. Um, he wants to be able to find someone else, uh, probably outside his family right now, that they can do this. So a lot of our farmers are asking for, um, you know, technical assistance, uh, uh, estate planning, uh, because you've got you've got two things going on. On they, they need to be able to live out their life and, and have a comfortable one and be able to survive, but they also have, there has to be a, an income provided to, the next generation or the new farmer that comes aboard. So that's the that's the charge. But from what we hear, uh, I have a dairy advisory panel. Um, we met and that was their number one priority was able to get workshops, access, and of course, you know, crunching the numbers and finding a way so they can make uh, the transfer. And part of this is going to be, there is going to be a generation that may have grown up on the farm that they do not want to do it. Uh, they do not want to farm. Um, there are so many opportunities. Uh, there's other things to do. Maybe they just don't want to do the day-to-day -day operations of, of running a farm, but they want to be another form of agriculture. So I think it's a it's a high priority. And, and if we can put more research, uh, more resources into anything that would enhance uh, transfer and planning and business planning and and so forth, I think that would be well served to protect farmland. Thank you so much. Uh... Secretary and Gus Bull, um, it's clear that, that time is not on our side to save our farmland, which is why AFT has just announced a bold goal of doubling the amount of permanently protected farmland by 2040 and reducing the rate of farmland conversion by 2,000 acres a day to 500 acres a day by 2040. We know that to get to this goal, we need to lock arms with so many partners and practitioners who are on this call and others around the US who are deeply concerned about saving the land that sustains us. So we hope that you'll be a part of this movement as well. Uh, Jamie, why don't you share some of the things that we've been working on locally to do our part? You bet, happy to, Nate. Um, and I'll, I'll go rather quick, because I know we're short on time. Um, but um, yeah, here, here um, at AFT, we are you know, building our capacity to better serve New England. So we're increasing staff capacity to focus on uh, farm protection, policy, education, conservation planning, grant making throughout New England. Um, we're working on protecting more farmland ourselves and with partners. So we're partnering with other land trusts and organizations to pursue innovative land protection projects, um, to increase the number of protected acres in the region and the conservation practices implemented on our farmland. Um, and this summer, we're actually partner partnering with um, Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, um, some of you here on the call, as, as well as some other regional uh, land trust partners, um, Land for Good um, in, in Northern New England. And we're going to be delivering a skill building webinar series on a variety of topics that we're targeting um, to smaller land trusts, municipalities, and community organizations. And um, really related to some of the, the threats we heard about earlier on this call, these are going to really offer specific tools um, and resources for protecting farmland, planning for ag, making land available to farmers. Uh, we didn't talk about this on the call, but you know, solar siting um, is a big concern in Vermont. Um, and as well as um, a, an entire workshop dedicated to um, 
ways you and your community can support Black, Indigenous, and farmers of color in, in, in your community. Um, so we will be launching a registration information for that um, next week. Uh, so please stay tuned for that. Um, and then we're also advocating for stronger state and federal policies. Um, we push for local funding and strong federal funding for various NRCS programs that have often been critical to farmland protection efforts in Vermont. We promote research-based decision-making and we plan to use these great findings from Farms Under Threat to guide our activities on the ground. And we're actively um, building on this research by projecting future threats from development and climate change out to the year 2040. Um, we're also finalizing um, the findings of a, a joint two-year research project on solar development policies and practices across New England and incorporating them into our advocacy efforts across the region. We hope to be able to share these with Vermont allies and help integrate it into any future uh, solar policies in Vermont. And um, one of our major local partners on that project has been um, the Vermont Law School. Um, and then lastly, I'll just mention um, we are providing direct financial support to farmers. Um, so we talked about some of the, the COVID challenges and um, you know, issues in, in the region that our, our farmers are facing. Um, so we had a, a farmer relief fund um, where we are trying to get uh, cash grants um, directly out to farmers. And I've also been administering a um, New England farmer micro grant program, um, working closely with farmers to help um, increase their farm productivity and land security. Uh, so those are just some of the things we've been working on and I'll, I'll kick it back to you, Nate. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, so, so what more can Vermont do? Um, analyzing and mapping agricultural land trends and conditions. You know, we, we think that every state can do more to be on top of its conversion trends. Um, states need a far better grasp of, of what they have and where they're losing farmland. Uh, we think folks should strengthen or adopt a coordinated suite of policies. You know, Vermont is a U.S. Climate Alliance state and has shown a willingness to use farmland protection and support of agricultural viability as effective tools to address environmental issues. But there are also powerful climate mitigation tools and motivators that provide significant opportunities to help farms, farmland, and our communities as a whole. Um, this has come up quite a bit today, but supporting farm viability and access to farmland. We see farm viability challenges as, as a major threat to farmland conservation. The abandonment of marginal pasture land has led to significant loss of farmland to forest land across northern New England. Uh, Vermont does have one of the best farm viability programs in the country, but even so, more can be done. Um, some other states are looking at beginning farmer tax credits or creating other incentives that, that seek to uh, incentivize and help with the transfer of land to the next generation. Uh, we also must proactively and aggressively work to address issues of farmland access, especially for black, indigenous, and, and farmers of color, such as these same tax credits, land leasing programs, direct financial support through, through grants and interest-free loans. Uh, planning for agriculture, not just around it, Act 250 has successfully reduced the amount of poorly planned development throughout Vermont. But one of the reasons that Vermont didn't score better in our, in our planning metric was that Vermont doesn't have a way to say at the local level that you you have to identify and protect your agricultural land through planning tools. It encourages it but doesn't mandate it. Um, the only state that's the only states, two of them that scored better than Vermont on this, both had mandates and required the identification and protection of agricultural land at the local level through planning. And lastly, save the best but don't forget the rest. We encourage all states, including Vermont, to view their high PVR lands as particularly important and worthy of targeted protection. While we acknowledge that all farmland has significant benefits for agriculture, as well as important co-benefits, our highest PVR lands are also the most threatened by conversion to both UHD and LPR conversion. Unmuted. Great, thank you, Nate. Um... I'm just going to quickly run through these past two and then turn it back to the secretary and Gus for any final thoughts. Um, we want to make people aware of two resources. The first is something that AFT has had for decades with um, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Services, a partner. That's the Farmland Information Center. It is a national clearinghouse of information about farmland and ranch land. Um, 
it is a wealth of information from statistics to any economic cases that have been made for saving land to information for landowners and we are developing a whole new section with agricultural conservation easement program uh, information both for partners and for landowners who might be interested in that program so please do see it as a resource um, there's the url farmlandinfo.org and they do answer questions either by phone or through the website so please feel free to pose those to them and then the national agricultural land network is something we've just launched this year and it's really an effort to build the collective capacity of all of us to be able to do more both about retaining land and permanently protecting it it is intended to facilitate peer networking information sharing and advanced training on what i like to call protection plus so how do you how do you combine protection with many of the things that we've talked about today, such as viability, access, um, uh, management and stewardship of protected farmland? So we hope that folks will join the network. I'm very pleased that Vermont has two members of the steering committee of that network. That's Nancy Everhart from BHCB and Nick Richardson. Um, who is the president of Vermont Land Trust. So thanks to the two of them for joining us to help build out this network in a way that's gonna be useful for all of our partners in Vermont. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it back for uh, to Gus and the secretary. I just wanna say thank you so much to the two of you. Um, really, we do consider Vermont a national leader. You all have been great in working with your delegation on the federal front and that delegation has been enormously helpful. So we thank you for all the work that you do on that end. And let me turn it back to you all for any final thoughts. And again, secretary, you've been going first, so please take another opportunity if you want um, for any perspectives. Well, well, thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, Nate, and everyone with American Farmland Trust and all our partners and the uh, Housing Conservation Board with Gus and the leadership he's shown over the last decades, uh, helping us get to a good place, and all the partners, particularly the local land trusts that play a, a critical part in USDA and, of course, uh, uh, the Vermont Land Trust as well. So we're just going to stay at it. Uh, we're going to we're going to try to make sure that uh, people pay attention to farmers, uh, understand that how valuable they are to to our landscape, understand how valuable to our economy they are, how important they are to actually feeding us, which we never should lose sight of the fact that our farmers are feeding us. Uh, it's rugged work, it's hard work, but it's rewarding work, and it's rewarding work to Vermont's economy. So we need to just double down our efforts to make sure we maintain the resources that we do have, whether it's maintaining, we keep that current use program uh, fully funded so it's available, uh, whether we need to make sure that we give the technical support uh, for farmers to transfer the farm to someone else so it stays in farmland. So we're just gonna stay at it and we appreciate all the leadership that everyone uh, has done with this research project. It's very valuable for us to have this data when we go to the legislature and also to the governor. So appreciate all the work and, and best, of, best of luck to you uh, in the future. Muted. Great, thank you, Gus. Anton's summary. Um, other than we really appreciate the work of the of our all of our local and state partners, our our friends at NRCS, in helping us work on all of these issues, and of the work of the American Farmland Trust as a national advocate for these programs, and we look forward to continuing the good relationship with our congressional delegation and you folks to pursue um, these national efforts. And hopefully just getting back to a point I tried to make earlier, the pandemic has revealed who our essential workers are and that includes farmers and food producers and we need to increase the federal state partnership that will allow us to get to move land to the next generation um, and to keep agriculture a productive and vital part of the of the Vermont economy. And we look forward to working with you on all those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so Thanks much, Gus. Thank you so much, Gus. Right. And Nate, 
Well, take it away, Nate. Sorry about the thank echo, you, folks. Um, echo, folks. Um, thank you so much, Gus. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, fellow AFT colleagues. I, I hope everybody enjoyed this. Please don't be shy about reaching out to us for access to this data. Um, have a great rest of your week and have a great weekend.